So again, uh, this is issues in biotechnology, the way we work with life. This is the on-campus version. Uh, we're filming for the online course. We are in this first section of the course called Mechanics of DNA. And this is the concluding last two lectures uh, in the section in which we have focused primarily on the question, what is life? Once we conclude uh, these next lectures, we will begin the second section of the course on applications in biotechnology. So evolution. The first part, we will consider how does it happen. We are not wondering if it happens. We wonder more how does it happen. And in the second part, we will look at genes and ideas. How uh, do genes evolve? And uh, how does this contribute to our understanding of ourselves and our society? And I will make a case that other uh, entities and ideas in our society a change along the same rules that biological organisms experience change. So evolution, how does it happen? I love this concept of biological evolution. I always have. Uh, it is never uh, really lost my awe. And hopefully uh, I can show you a little bit about why. We've already um, looked at the questions involving how does life begin? How did life begin on this planet? How possibly would it occur elsewhere? Uh, I think that we can say that once we have information and once we have cells on this planet, we can understand how these mechanisms might play out in order to derive what we see today. That's the case I want to make. How does life change on this planet? I read you <coughs> um, this essay that I penned on this I believe where I said that I believe in life. Um, I made a copy of this and I also suggested that as um, extra credit uh, you also can attempt your own This I Believe essay. Uh, the rules are simple, that it is 500 words or less. Uh, it will count as extra credit in addition to your quiz grade. Um, and it should be positive. Try to uh, couch your argument in terms of a positive statement rather than a negative statement, but um, I'm all all interested in, in what you have to say. I also um, suggested that as another component to extra credit, separate, you can try your own definition of life in 50 words or less. Mine is embedded in this essay and you can count the words that I think there are exactly 50. So evolution, what is it? How does it work? And then lastly, why does it remain a controversial idea? Do you, for example, believe that the process of evolution provides a sufficient explanation for biological diversity and the origin of new species? Most of you agree, you know, that's vastly outside the national average. Um, the national average to this question would suggest that uh, the no would register at about 60 or 67 percent or so and would vary from state to state. But you are consistent with uh, previous data on that question. Do you think that the main reason evolution as a concept is controversial in the United States is because of religious conflicts, lack of education, it's not properly presented, it's not in the public view or experience, or that it's simply not true? 
religious conflicts. So therein, you can see that 63% of our class uh, would think that the reason for its controversial nature is embedded in religious ideas. 20% um, roughly or so feel as though it's lack of education. And certainly, we can say that in a country where we learn the solar system by grade four, very few individuals in our population can describe how DNA works, uh, let alone what life is or uh, how it might change. So we can see that certainly um, education about biology uh, might interact uh, and cause conflicts with thinking about, about biology. That's consistent also with previous data. Do you believe that we should continue to seek alternative explanations for biological diversity uh, and the origin of new species, or perhaps we're satisfied with what we have? In other words, is evolution adequately explaining biological diversity? And although not directly stated in this question, um, I'll wait until you're done, but maybe should we teach alternative explanations in public schools has become a question that is hotly debated in some states more than others. You may remember a few years ago uh, it went uh, to higher courts. Uh, so the answer there is yes, that we should continue to seek alternative explanations by a, a vast number. And I think that's consistent with the scientific process. In fact, if any of you, uh, say, wrote an article in a peer-reviewed journal which absolutely undermined what our current understanding of the process of evolution, uh, you will live on in infamy, there's no doubt. Uh, but, um, you know, that's a tall order. It's a big challenge, and if you could do that, that'd be awesome. In terms of teaching alternative explanations that lack evidence-based reports, however, uh, perhaps these should not be uh, relegated to scientific points of view unless they contain science that merited that discussion. It's also rather consistent with previous data. So uh, remember, in the first lecture, I wanted to make a point to distinguish fact, uh, observation, truth, knowledge, and the word theory. As the word theory is a systematically organized knowledge applicable in a wide variety of circumstances, and this usually uh, comes about from not one hypothesis, but multiple repeated observations over a period of time. So it's a collection of observations that all lead to a consistent uh, idea. For example, the theory of gravity. Um, much has talked about gravity. Um, have we absolutely proven a theory of gravity? Not exactly. Uh, the Higgs boson, remember, was just discovered on July 4th, 2012, a very famous day, actually, and that this more or less solidifies the standard model of physics. And we understand a lot more now about the Big Bang and its consequence, uh, and what dark matter is throughout the universe. Based on the observation of the Higgs boson, we learn a lot more about gravity. And we also know that if I were to take the keys out of my pocket, they will fall to the floor. But we really don't have an explanation adequately for that. Although our observations are consistent with what we now see exemplified in what we know about the theory of gravity. Similarly, the theory of evolution. So what I will try to discuss tonight is uh, an introduction to uh, how evolution works and the filter that is put onto that mechanism that we call natural selection. Both of these ideas are uh, widely misunderstood, I think, 
and that leads to a lot of the misunderstandings that people have uh, about evolution as an explanation for biological diversity. I mean, there is no doubt that when you look out the window, you see lots of different organisms. The question comes about, how did they get here? And where did the ones that were here go? So, just to summarize where we've come so far in this class, we understand that information is contained in DNA and that there is a flow of information that's consistent in all life on this planet, uh, no matter basically how you define that. Uh, whether you're a virus, a pea plant, a whale, or a human, the flow of information standardly goes from DNA to RNA to proteins, and this is in a cycle. There are some viruses that are RNA-based that reinform its host to make DNA, but essentially then uh, this paradigm plays out. So we also see that the genetic code is consistent on this planet, so that uh, certain sequences spell specifically for certain amino acids. So there are 20 amino acids that are used in this genetic code, and the genetic code is consistent in life. Now that's a remarkable set of observations right there. It's not that a pea plant has a different genetic code from a human. Practically, this means that I can take a gene out of a pea plant and put it into another organism, and it will make exactly that same protein. And we learned that the information in a gene is much like the information in a paragraph. That a single letter, like a base pair, uh, in a sense carries not much information. If you string a triplet of these together, uh, you could have a very short word, dog, cat, the, etc., but not much, not much information there. But a gene might be more like the information in a paragraph. A chromosome could contain up to maybe 3,000 genes or so. Uh, with a lot of intervening DNA that is not encoding protein and that a volume, uh, uh, that chromosome might be like a volume in a set of volumes of encyclopedias. We also made uh, the point that this is not information in a static sense. I think previously a lot of people tried to convey this as if it were strings on a bead or beads on a string that uh, are rather static. DNA should really not be understood this way, because that's not what we observe. We observe a more fluid information system. That, for example, during the making of gametes, eggs and sperm, chromosomes cross over and switch arms. So you get an exchange of information between what was previously your parents into what will be your offspring. So this, this shuffles the deck considerably. And that exchange is not always exact. So that, that those segments that switch places shown in this slide is not precise, but moreover that we shuffle the deck. So we can say, you know, you have your grandfather's eyes and your grandmother's nose. You know, these are characteristics that are inherited and passed down. And we can do breeding and demonstrate this in animals like cats and dogs and thoroughbred horses and so on and in plants, like I'll show you next week. But that's only one way of enhancing genetic variation. So we know since Gregor Mendel that we inherit these traits. Some of them are single gene traits, like hemophilia. Some of them are complex traits, like your grandmother's nose. You know, these are many genes that come together to exert that trait. We can also see chromosome duplication. Whole chromosomes can duplicate. Or as we saw in uh, chimpanzees, that chromosomes can actually fuse together. So we can get whole genome duplication and we can get chromosome loss, where chromosomes are lost out of the situation or fused together. So this information is being shuffled all over the place. And I couldn't find a slide that actually demonstrated the diversity of the mechanisms that are involved in variation. So I attempted one morning over coffee to draw one with this very unsophisticated software called a pencil. And so that resulted in 
this slide, and sorry I didn't have the better graphics to do this in time for this class, but basically these are uh, some of the different mechanisms that I came up with, and this is not an exhaustive list, but at the top over on the left you see uh, single base pair changes. An A can go to a T, a G can go to a C, and I'll show you in a little while what those changes can exert. We went over some of them already in a previous class. You can get single base pair changes. This happens all the time when you're copying your DNA. We can have gene insertions or gene deletions. A whole gene could be inserted into another place on a chromosome. Viruses can insert this way several genes into your chromosomes. But whole genes can be inserted. This is what we do when we genetically engineer an organism. We can take foreign DNA out of an organism and move it into another and it will randomly insert. Or this just happens all of the time anyway. Even we see, since Barbara McClintock did this, that genes can get up out of their situation, move to another location, and insert. This is also not precise. So what if a gene that's leaving its location takes some of its information with it and then reshuffles that to another location? Or where it inserts, it knocks out a gene or changes its function. So that's another way of which you can encourage variation in the genome. Another way is this translocation that I mentioned that these jumping genes, we call them transposons, can get up, move, and reinsert. And in this way you can move exons, protein coding parts of a gene, you can move promoters and change expression characteristics of genes, and so on. You can get exon shuffling. Let's say a part of a gene that codes for a specific enzyme function. Remember you have exons interrupted by introns in eukaryotic genes? What if that domain is doing something really good for that protein and then it moves and inserts into a protein that has no related function whatsoever? It has transferred whatever that function was to a totally different protein. Now you have a totally different protein doing something that is a mix of what it was doing before plus that function. Follow that? That's a little bit complicated, but we're, we're shuffling the deck. You see what I mean? We're taking functions and moving them around, and this is what's going on all over the place. We can have gene duplications, and this is very important towards providing variation for evolution. What if, we'll go back to his hemoglobin gene, if we've got a copy of his hemoglobin gene, and let's just say he had one. We already know he has six, and one of them doesn't work, but let's just say he had one. And that's pretty important, because if he lost that one, he's not around to talk about it too much. So let's say this one copies. Now you've got two copies. This one, when it copies itself, if it mutates and goes on, and something really goes wrong with it, it's okay, we got another copy. That means that old one is free to more or less change. Some of those changes are going to be bad, but that's okay, we've got another copy. Right? If we have one that outcompetes the other one, now we've got a better one than the first one. So gene duplication turns out to be a driving force in variation that encourages evolution. Another one is, is that we can duplicate whole chromosome sets. We can go from 2N to 4N. Modern day corn is derived exactly this way. We call it a diploid today, but it's a functional tetraploid. Plants do this all the time. So do insects, lots of other organisms. What I mean by this list, you've got variation all over the place. So whatever you've been taught before, that slow changes in evolution build up to speciation, in some cases is correct. But what you have to realize is that it's not just these single base pair changes taking over eons of time. This is large-scale shuffling, right? And I think I made this case before, but if I can really stick this home right now, there's lots of variation. Lots and lots of it, and lots of ways of doing it. And this happens in all organisms. 
So what is life? Life is an information processing system capable of replication with variation mediated by metabolism through biochemistry in an aqueous environment and subjected to selection in the stochastic chance and necessity consequential from the Big Bang resulting in perceptions of beauty, knowledge, truth, love, consciousness, free will, morality, self, and life. It's 50 words. What I mean by that is that it's a collection of information and it's mediated out through the processes that you see in organisms and it's selected all of this change in what we see around us. I challenge you to come up with one. I think it's fun. So also what we see is it's a community of information. You yourself are not only just a human. We already know that mitochondria that make up every, in every cell of your body are likely the ancestors of an ancient endosymbiotic event. We also can demonstrate that your genome itself is populated with the invasion of ancient viruses that are hitching a ride on you for your, their replication. Some of them cause cancer. Some of them are just benign. Some of them are just ancient sequences that no longer function for really anything at all. But they leave their footprint behind. So actually, you are also a combination of admixtures of previous organisms that led up to us. Obviously. We know this from looking at comparative genomics. We also see that this variation and this type of change is a consistent pattern in life on this planet that evolution is really a pattern of life that gives rise to this diversity and that if we perhaps are uncomfortable with the word theory at this point to describe this, uh, like the theory of gravity that we might say we could call the law of gravity, I'm perfectly comfortable with saying that given biological organisms there will be change. I think that's a consistent statement with what we see about, about life. So that common observation reveals that organisms change over time. That is, a species uh, changes over time and some go extinct. So the existence of species on Earth has not remained constant. So that um, We've seen species come and species go. There have been periods of marked by mass extinctions. Uh, one most notably at the end of the Jurassic period and the loss of the dinosaurs and about 60% of other species on this planet, but that wasn't the only mass extinction. And we are currently in one now in the Anthropocene. So, Fossils of organisms that are no longer found on Earth means that extinction does occur. I think we can recognize that uh, there are no longer mastodons or giant ground sloths or Irish elks. And uh, it was first George Cuvier, Cuvier that uh, recognized this. And Charles Darwin actually synthesized a lot of ideas based on his observations of life and diversity from his travels uh, as an explanation for biological diversity. And really his observations that led up to the culmination of uh, origin of species were based on these two observations. One, that, that, that there was a resemblance of island finches uh, between mainland finches uh, in the Galapagos. And the second was is that he noticed a peculiar resemblance between extinct species to living species that occurred in that same area. Uh, the cliptodont, for example, was an extinct ancient form that resembled very much the extant version that we recognize today as the hairy armadillo. And Darwin looked at this and said, well, look at that. There's a striking resemblance between something that was there 
and something that is here now. But first, this idea about um, the finches. What he noticed was is that 22 of the 29 species of birds on the Galapagos are found only on those islands. That is, that they are endemic to those islands. That certain islands have a specific kind of finch. You go to another island, and there's another kind of finch. They do have one thing in common. They all resemble the mainland finches that he saw in Ecuador. So Darwin collected these specimens from each of the 29. And at first, he paid not much notice to them, but he saw that some were woodpecker-like. They had beaks that could uh, seek out insects. And other ones were warbler-like. And uh, what he noticed is, is that these, these finches uh, were specific to a specific island. And that these were geographically isolated uh, as islands. So we had some on some islands that were seed-eating species and had beaks that could crack, crack seeds, a uh, powerful thick beak. They had uh, other species on another island that um, had a longer probe-like beak for eating grubs out of the barks of trees. And there were other ones that could eat um, cone-eating species, and a third or a fourth one that, uh, for example, um, had a mixed diet. And he could characterize these uh, back to their common ancestor, uh, as shown in this, um, this cladogram. The second thing that he noticed was is that there was a resemblance between extinct species and living species. And we see this all over the place as represented in fossils, shown here uh, as this uh, representation. Um, this one is a extinct species of, sp of fern, a fish, and uh, Archaeopteryx, the, the dinosaur bird. We also see that in the life, life's natural history is a record of succession and extinction, but it shows from ancient uh, time periods, Procambrian, uh, up to present, uh, a progression of new organisms appearing and some like the dinosaurs going extinct. And even within this, while we have land plants starting during the Devonian period, uh, flowering plants don't occur until the Cretaceous period, and even some of these are lost out of uh, the development of land plants that we see today. So Darwin's ideas just didn't come out of the nowhere. Uh, rather, his ideas were built on the shoulders of giants themselves. For example, George Buffon um, suggested that the Earth was much older than previously believed during the early 1700s. And as I already mentioned, uh, George Cuvier mentioned that uh, by documenting fossil discoveries showed that extinction had occurred, that the fossils indicated that there were animals and plants that were at one time alive that no longer existed. And I will talk about Jean-Baptiste Lamarck in a little while, but between 1744 and 1829, during his lifetime, suggested that living species might change over time. Um, so he suggested the notion that species as a group, not as an individual, changes over time, that the population of a species changes over time. He had some explanations that I'll allude to in a minute as to how he thought that might occur. But uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck was uh, among the first to say that species change over time. Charles Lyell was a uh, contemporary of Darwin. And he was a geologist who argued that geological forces, earthquakes, volcanoes, tsunamis, um, et cetera, uh, rivers making canyons had gradually shaped the earth and that continue to do so today. All of this uh, was in Darwin's mind when he uh, 
started his thinking about biological diversity. And so all of these different ideas, dating as far back as Linnaeus, who started naming organisms. You know, Linnaeus, Carlos Linnaeus, gave us the binomial system of naming genus and species. Homo sapien, for example. Uh, that there is a genus species, but, you know, kingdom, phylum, class, order, genus, species, etc., is a system that was devised by Carlos Linnaeus, and he started naming individual species and realized that uh, these could be characterized as a species by um, off making offspring that uh, if, if a separate species is defined as not being able to mate with a different species and make fertile offspring. There are lots of exceptions to that. And as I already alluded to, we've made some in our own laboratory. So um, that does happen. But Linnaeus, from Linnaeus to Lamarck during the French Revolution, uh, and then Cuvier on paleontology, Lyell on um, geology, uh, all overlapping with Darwin in the 1800s. And notice that this overlaps with Mendel in the discovery of genetics and inheritance. Um, and uh, this fellow, Alfred Wallace, who I'll get to in a minute. So how do organisms change? We had Jean-Baptiste Lamarck who said they do. And uh, Darwin, who agrees, they do. So uh, what are their explanations for this? Lamarck looked at populations of giraffes. And we see today that giraffes have long necks. He looked back in history, fossil records, and so on, and saw that po populations of giraffes had short necks. So we wonder, how did giraffes get their long necks of today? According to Lamarck, giraffes living in their environment on the savanna, uh, having short necks, would feed on trees and the leaves of trees. And when those leaves became depleted by those populations of giraffes, that those, some would stretch their necks to reach the upper leaves. And by stretching their necks uh, to reach the upper leaves, would pass that trait onto their offspring owing to the fact now that we have long-necked giraffes. So Lamarck, I think, astutely noted and that uh, species change over time. His idea was based on adaptation and will of the organism. So Lamarck noted how well adapted organisms were to their environment and believed that fossils could be understood as less perfect forms that had perished because of their inability to change. And he developed this in terms of uh, his ideas were based on the use and disuse hypothesis for biological change and perfection with use and need. So in use and disuse, he, he looked at things like parasites and other organisms that lost parts that uh, they didn't need like the missing eyes of a digestive system, uh, uh, or the missing eyes and digestive system of a tapeworm, or the vestigial femur of marine mammals. If marine mammals were derived from land mammals, where did the legs go? Well, Lamarck would say if they didn't use them, they lost them. It's a use and disuse idea, use it or lose it. He also would say that perfection comes with use. So the constant use of an organ leads uh, that organ to increase in size like the muscles of a blacksmith or the ears of a night flying bat and that those traits then are passed on to offspring. So Darwin looks at the idea entirely differently. He looks at the idea that saying like, okay, in your fossil record you got a lot of short-necked giraffes, but what if there was a mutation in which a low number, one, or a low number had a long neck. So therefore, when the pressure came on and there were no more low-hanging leaves, that the one that had the long neck 
would live long enough through that stress to reproduce. And if that mutation then were successful at getting those low-hanging leaves, that one with the long neck would produce more offspring. And eventually the long neck ones would outcompete the short neck ones. Uh, and that gene, that mutation for long neck, would increase in the population. You see? So he would say, by difference, it wasn't use and disuse, uh, like saying, oh, if I just had a long neck, things would be okay, and passing that trade on. He would say that the variation already existed. And you put the pressure on, and the only ones that are going to actually make offspring live long enough are the ones that have enough food to eat to live long enough to make offspring. Got it? So then the population is gradually replaced by long-necked giraffes because they survive long enough with that trait to make babies. When we talk about survival of the fittest and natural selection, we're really mainly concerned with if that gene goes on into the next population. I could get into it at the molecular level, but I think that's beyond um, this particular course. So, on the left, we have Lamarck's idea, which is use and disuse, and uh, perfection through use driven. And on the right, we have Darwin's idea, which presents the, uh, the notion that variation exists in the population and is selected by the pressure of the environment to pass those genetics on. Subtle, but different. Try this one. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck thought for giraffes that by stretching their necks for leaves higher in, the, in trees, that this characteristic would be passed on to the offspring of those giraffes. Lamarck, therefore, proved that the theory of evolution was incorrect, proposed that the inheritance of characteristics acquired as a result of the environment or purpose C showed that bacteria experienced Darwinian selection and evolution by watching slot machines. Develop, or D developed the idea for the phylogenetic tree. Or E proved that organisms can willfully direct their own evolution. Yeah, thank you. Glad we're paying attention here. This is subtle, but it's very important because this actually lies at the controversy of people understanding evolution. It doesn't matter how much you will yourself to grow your neck and pass. If you absolutely could do that, that'd be remarkable. But it'd be more astonishing if you were able to pass that trade on to your kids. So I think we can see, you know, in retrospect, we use this idea to sort of say that Lamarck was kind of silly, but actually, um, he was astute to recognize that organisms change. And in his day, that was a bold observation. So Darwin, then, uh, to show that he just didn't come up with this uh, virtually on his own, we see that he's building this idea on a history of observations. But also, he didn't just sit at home and come up with this idea. Uh, he, have, he, he first enrolled in theology school and was going to become a minister, and decided that uh, that wasn't what he had in mind. And he got a job. He got a job on a boat, the HMS Beagle. Um, and he was afforded the opportunity to travel the world for several years. And uh, in his day and age, what an opportunity. Imagine, you know, uh, to get out of Oxford, and go and see the world on this boat. And this shows you his trajectory. This is uh, out of your reading assignment for this week in the textbook, the Phelan textbook, What is Life? This is in chapter 8. But it shows you from leaving England, going to uh, South America, traveling around South America, going to the Galapagos, but also over to New Zealand through the Indian Ocean. So uh, Darwin got to experience a worldwide voyage. And so he had thought about his ideas of, um, from based on his observation of resemblance of 
finches and a lot of other observations and that extinct species tend to resemble extant species, that he had finally written a draft of the book, Origin of Species. Now this is a several hundred page book, you know, and actually you should pick it up and peruse it, if not read it in its entirety, to see the genius of Darwin. And he was in communication with Charles Lyell about this and realized that what he was about to say was provocative. And he wanted to understand that what he was about to say was correct. He was not one to shoot from the hip. So um, how do new species emerge through the occurrence of randomly generated variation? Remember, this is pre-Mendel. This is pre-DNA. Everything I described to you already, you already know about DNA. You already know about chromosomes. You know about how things are inherited. He had no idea about these things. So he's just piecing this together based on the variation in organisms that he sees around the planet. And he's just ready to publish this when in 1858 he receives a letter. Alfred Wallace was a young naturalist working in the East Indies and had wrote a very short paper on a novel theory that he had sent in to get published. And Darwin was going to be the reviewer, one of the reviewers. Uh, and he had asked Darwin to evaluate it and to pass it along for publication. Actually, early peer review, if you will. So can you imagine Darwin getting this paper on his desk before he's published Origin of the Species? I mean, would you freak out or what? Look at the title, On the Tendency of Varieties to Depart Indefinitely from the Original Type. Oh, what a loss. He's been working for decades, and now this guy from the West Indies, Alfred Wallace, is just ready to pretty much scoop him. You know? And in science, I have to tell you, this happens all the time. And actually, it's not... It's not just in science. If you think you have a good idea, I don't even care what it is. I will bet that somebody, somewhere, in the seven billion people that are on this planet is having that idea too, or already did. You might think you're clever, but there's somebody out there, somewhere, that is thinking the same thing as you. I almost can guarantee that. I've seen this happen so many times. Um, so many patents, I wake up, I go, oh, this is it. This is great. No one's ever going to think about this. This is beautiful, you know. And, you know, you think like, this is so clever. I've got plenty of time to write this up. And then something like this, you know. You go like, how could this possibly be? But I'll tell you something. If everybody on the planet is exposed to the same information that you are, you know, uh, you may think you're clever, but there's a lot of clever people. And exposed to the same stimulus, something like this is bound to happen. So he wrote to Lyell, who had been pestering him to publish Origin of Species, and he said, Your words have come true with a vengeance. I never saw a more striking coincidence. So all my originality, whatever may it amount to, will be smashed. He accepted the paper and passed it on and published Origin of the Species. Notice we don't, we call it Darwinian evolution and not Wallaceian evolution. You probably never heard of Alfred Wallace, right? I mean, we've all heard of Darwin. So uh, what happened? Well, you can look up the rest of that story if you're so interested. But evolution is a process. We've touched on the, the basics of it. I've already mentioned single base pair changes. You change an A to a T and look at what can happen. We already discussed this in a previous lecture, but here you have a gene with no mutation. Here's the DNA sequence, here's the messenger RNA sequence. AUG spells for methionine, UGU spells for cysteine, UCC spells for serine, and on it goes. 
If you drop out one of these bases, shown here in this deleted base pair, what you end up with is a frame shift mutation. So you still read the AUG for methionine, but now instead of UGU for cysteine, we have UUU, which spells for phenylalanine, and that's a different amino acid, and everything downstream is misread. Do we think for a minute that that protein is going to be the same? Absolutely not. It might not even function, or it might function better. Now you have variation. Variation in that protein. What if that protein were involved in one of the master control switches that's turning on a lot of other genes? Now you've elicited a lot of change with a very small one. Or the bottom example where we insert a single base pair change. So mechanisms of evolution. We have single base pair changes. Those could really bum out a whole protein sequence, as I just showed you. And you, mutations generally are going to be negative. Out of all of the variation that occurs, however, some of it is going to be benign, some of it is even going to be positive, but you're only going to recognize that with some sort of selection filter, right? If it's just occurring and there's no selection filter, big deal. So you have change. I can see it in this room. Yeah, there's change. Big deal. There's no big deal until you ask for it, right? So, you know, you, in this case, as shown here, you have a normal protein from this normal sequence. You have a mutated base, an inserted one or a deleted one. And let's say that's involved in a gene that's involved with development. You can have severe consequences. And this is present all over the place in populations. So mutations change DNA sequence and are one of the bases for variation. I showed you my little diagram that I came up with that shows you a whole host of other mechanisms for variation. Deletions, insertions, chromosome duplications, and so on. And that we already know that the sequence in the gene codes for a protein. So if we have changes in those proteins, we can have changes in organismal function. We can have some of those changes might result in giraffes having long necks. So, in about 1943, Salvador Loria, uh, a microbiologist, works on bacteria, was wondering if bacteria, simple prokaryotic organisms, evolve like higher organisms such as Darwin described. In other words, do bacteria, however simple they may seem, evolve along the same principles as giraffes, or as humans, or as anything else? And he uh, was at a um, he was at an alumni dance, and he was watching slot machines, uh, and he was wondering if Darwinian principles then apply to bacteria, and how are slot machines like bacteria? He got this idea by watching slot machines, so. Um, genius as he was, he realized that a slot machine payoff is a relatively rare event. But if you watch enough of them, or if you play enough slot machines all night, the probability of a payoff increases. So the more you watch, you might see a rare event like a payoff. So some machines will produce no payoffs, other ones a few payoffs, and a few very big payoffs. So in order to set up this experiment, we have to realize what uh, a few observations that were afforded to Salvador Loria at the time. He was working with uh, viruses called bacteriophage. Bacteriophage infect bacteria. They're viruses that infect bacteria. And um, the bacteriophage injects its DNA into its host. And the invading viral DNA orders the cell to make multiple copies of the viral DNA, which forms then new viruses until that cell explodes, releasing those viruses when it lyses to go out and reinfect other bacteria. And this happens very rapidly. So the virus infects the bacteria, it copies itself, causes lysis of the bacteria, 
and then it goes on to reinfect cells. This is a very similar pattern which happens with a lot of viruses. So if we were to take a bacteria and grow it in a media which allows that bacteria to divide rapidly, um, and actually Loria developed his own media for doing this, a nutrient broth that we still use today in most labs. It's called LB broth, Loria broth. So it will pretty much grow any microbe. Very cool to have a media named after you. I've actually invented a few media myself for plants, but I don't think there's a couch media yet. You know, I don't know what, what I did wrong or what he did right, but there's an LB media, and you can pretty much grow anything in LB broth. So if you take a bacteria and put it into LB broth, it will grow overnight in liquid, back, in liquid LB broth and make that uh, cloudy with bacteria. Um, billions of cells overnight at 37 degrees C. <laughs> Now, if you take one of these bacteriophage and you drop it in there, the solution goes clear. It will lyse all of those cells in about 20 minutes. Now let's take that same flask, move it back into the incubator. It's totally clear. And you leave it there overnight again. You come back and it's totally full of bacteria. So you lysed all the bacteria, you dropped in the bacteriophage, it went clear, you put that clear solution back into the incubator and it again becomes cloudy. Now you take that flask and you put in the bacteria, you put in the phage. Nothing happens. They're all resistant. They're all resistant to the phage. How did that happen? Well, there must have been some that survived, right? So the question comes, did they become resistant because they were challenged or were they already resistant when you challenged them? That was the question that Salvador Loria wanted to ask. So out of the billion of bacteria, all of these are resistant. So the question really comes to Loria. Is the resistance caused by the challenge of the virus, like Lamarck and the giraffes stretching their necks, or is the resistant resistance arising by chance mutations within the population selected by the challenge of the virus. So how do we figure this out? It's a good question. Good scientific question. So Loria challenged this with this experiment where he grew virus sensitive bacteria in a couple hundred tubes, dropped in the bacteria liquid LB broth, and then use them to inoculate petri plates that had solid LB broth with the virus already in it. So the virus would infect these cells and if they were sensitive, they'll lice and die. If they're resistant, they'll grow. A day later, any cell resistant to the virus would make a visible colony. So Loria reasoned that if the bacteria acquired the resistance, that it learned it, by contact with the virus that all the dishes would have approximately the same number of cells. You should have 10 colonies or something per every single petri plate because every single bacteria would have the same chance of learning it, right? Since they all encounter the same challenge uniformly. But if the resistance was caused by random mutations in the bacterial genome and they were already present when the, whether the virus was present or not, when he plates those bacteria, the dishes should look very different. Many would have no colonies at all. Some would have a few. Some would have very small numbers. We remember from DNA replication that changes result in mutations randomly. That even though it might be a high fidelity system, while we're sitting here discussing it, you've already made a few mistakes. Sorry. Hopefully it's not going to bum you out later, right? Hopefully you won't pass those on. But hopefully you've made some good changes too, right? And hopefully you'll pass those on. We're going to need those. But mistakes occur. There's no question about that. We can measure it. One in ten to the five times, while we're sitting here, you're making a mistake. The result? Ha ha! There were different numbers on the plates. 
There were different numbers on the plates. You see what this is? The variation was already there. Just like it's already here. He challenges it all uniformly with the virus and the change was already there. If someone says you can't prove evolution, you can do this overnight. The change is already there. It's, it's visualized by the challenge. Now if you take one of those colonies and you grow it up again and challenge it, it's resistant. That organism is permanently changed. It is resistant. And that resistance will be inherited forever. Or until it loses that change. So random changes in DNA sequence explain the variation in Loria's bacterial cultures and in populations of other organisms as well. Okay, that's a simple example. And you can just say, well, heck, they're just bacteria. How smart are they? Right? But no, it's the same. DNA is DNA. We've already explained that part. Variation is existence all over the place. We already know that. It's the challenge now that we're interested in. Look it. In 1918, there was the Spanish flu that went across the world. Six million Americans died in one year. And in those days, that was a lot of people. And about half of the people that got that virus died. We'll talk about this when we talk about pandemic flu. But, you know, probably if I took that same influenza virus and spread it across this room now, about half of you would die. It's nothing too much different than what Loria did in this experiment. There's nothing you could do right now to change your resistance to the Spanish flu. It's already here in this room. The experiment's already been done. I don't want to repeat it. But, see, it's the same in a bacteria as a human, as a fish, as a toad, as a pea plant. The variation's there. The selection pressure is what will make it visible. If the selection pressure influences that population to pass those genes on, voila, you've changed the whole population. So mutations govern a large part of that variation. So a mutation like a slot machine is a relatively rare event. But if you look at enough of them, you're going to see it. So by plating a few hundred tubes, with several billion bacteria in them, you're going to see a few payoffs, as exemplified by the colonies on his plates. So this means that the variation was there before the selection by exposure to the virus. So, Dr. Kausch, does this really happen in other organisms? I mean, those are just simple bacteria. Let's look at a fruit fly. A fruit fly has almost the same number of genes as a human, and they have some pretty sophisticated behaviors. Um, they know when to get food. Um, they fly around. They have mating behaviors that are pretty interesting. How long can a fruit fly survive without food? Not an experiment we want to repeat on humans. And actually, we could say, actually, that it's kind of mean to do this to fruit flies, too. But if you were to take 5,000 fruit flies as an initial setup and remove the food uh, and wait some period of time, let's wait until about 80% of them starve to death. So you're watching 20% of the flies are still buzzing around and living, and 80% of them are dead on the bottom of the cage. And then once those are dead, you record the average starvation resistance time. So the next generation, after surviving, uh, the flies eat a little bit, and you collect the eggs of the flies that uh, lay them and transfer them to a new cage. We repeat that experiment and find out that in the first case, uh, generation one, the average resistance time was 20 hours until starvation. 
The next time we've increased that population to 23 hours until starvation, until through 60 generations of repetitively selecting for how long that fruit fly can go without food, you've increased the average time of starvation to upwards around 160 hours. I mean, this experiment has been done, it has been repeated, and you can continue to repeat this on random Drosophila populations, and the same thing happens. This didn't just happen once and somebody said, hey, look at that. And by the way, you can go and redo Loria's experiment as well. That's the great thing about science is it's repeatable. It's not just that like, oh, he did that once. But we can do this again with fruit flies. So yes, it happens in eukaryotic organisms as well. So over many generations, this pressure that we call natural selection, selecting out of a population allows for a population to be recovered with increased resistance to starvation. The same would go for complex organisms like uh, wildebeest, as exam exemplified here, that every set of chromosomes uh, that you receive from your mother and your father differ slightly with different alleles. You have the nose of your grandmother, the eyes of your grandfather, you know, etc. These are traits that you've inherited from your two sets of chromosomes. And again, we have variation all over the place. So does this affect humans? Here's one example that I pull out of an article that was published in the journal Science about how mutations might affect humans. And in this case, a single amino acid change is resulting in a, in a, a significant memory capability in human populations. A single amino acid change in one brain protein can vastly affect memory in humans. Uh, we can catch up with that one later. How does selection of random DNA changes occur in other organisms? We just saw that. And do random point mutations in DNA provide sequence variation? That's only one part of the equation. But first of all, how does selection of random DNA changes occur in other organisms? Here's an example where we have normal genes that yield normal proteins, and here's an enzyme in a flower that's responsible for making the pigment anthocyanin. Anthocyanin is a common red pigment in plants, uh, produced by an enzymatic pathway that is consistent in a lot of plants that make red pigments. In fact, we can clone these genes and move them out of one plant and into another and confer and study floral pigments. But these are mainly used by uh, flowers to attract pollination vectors like bees. So the flower, not intentionally obviously, but the, the bee attracts, is attracted to the color of the flower uh, and the color is linked to things like nectaries that the bee can be nourished out of and in the meantime get some pollen stuck on itself and goes to the next flower and pollinates it. So the, the plant is in this case using the bee as a vector for pollinating. And it will, if you have a mutation in the anthocyanin pathway, a mutation in the protein that is affecting flower color. And let's say you have a white flower. Well, those genes are not going to be passed on because they're bypassed by the bee. So the bee is going to continuously propagate red flowers, and red flowers then continuously um, populate the population. You might see a white one once in a while, but the population does not all convert over. You will see some mutations in the anthocyanin pathway which would actually improve flower color and make it more red. And then those bees would be attracted to only that flower, and those genes would increase then in the population, making more red uh, the predominant color. I want to show you that this does not only pertain to biology. Look at the evolution of headlights. When cars were first invented, we had a lot of horse and buggies, right? And cars, motorized horses and buggies, were illuminated at night by lanterns, which was the technology of the day. 
mounted onto these motorized horses and buggies without the horses. And eventually, rather than on the side by the driver's seat, they were moved to the front of the car. You could see better. Electrified headlights came later. They were eventually mounted in defenders. This idea gave rise to this idea, where they were mounted, uh, embedded into the fenders, and eventually uh, headlights were integral into the fenders. Now, these days, in your lifetime, I am sure you are going to see a roboticized car. Google is developing this now, and California is passing laws to get them on the road. You know, like you have map Google Maps, great. You can get from here to Narragansett and uh, know the directions by your phone telling you where to go without even having a clue. There will be a day when you'll get in your car and it will have Google Map function. You'll press a button and it will take you to Narragansett. So you can see how the evolution of ideas from headlights mounted on the driver's seat to getting in a car and it automatically takes you there. I think that'll be a great day, by the way. Great day. It'll solve so many problems, right? Just, you won't, you won't need to know where to go. You won't have traffic jams. You won't have tailgaters. You won't have a lot of accidents. You won't have a lot of DUIs. It'll just get you there. It's great. But I want to preempt this by saying ideas are under selection pressure just the way viruses are, just the way organisms are. Some ideas survive better than others. Some ideas have long staying power. Other ones go extinct. What was a cassette tape? Oh my god, that's crazy, right? Gametes, variation. Some are lost out of the population, like cassette tapes, like CDs, like Facebook will be. So genes are lost out of the equation by selection pressure, predation. If you're too slow, you go. And extinct, you lose. Your gametes no longer go on. If you can't swim, too bad. You're out of the equation too. Only the swimmers in that case propagate their genes. If your flower color is too pale and things shift, that's it. The Spanish flu hits, half of you are gone. That's it. Whatever other genes you had don't matter. I don't care how fast you can run or what your IQ might be. It only matters in that instance if you survive the Spanish flu. All those other genes that go with that resistance go on. Do you get an idea how beautiful this is? complicated a little bit, but it's exquisite. I think it becomes more beautiful as you understand its complexity and see how intricately this is all interwoven into the fabric of what we call ecology. It's, it's just absolutely incredible. What I do mean to exemplify with the wildebeest example is that we have uh, variations in population. And these variations can be selected for uh, based on the environment. The necessary conditions for selection of any given trait, any given trait which will be propagated on through generations, is variations of that trait. Shown here, for example, in skin color in humans. Uh, we're all very familiar with the variation in skin color in human populations as it varies around the planet. And its skin color is relatively a very low number of genes uh, which constitute a variation in this trait. <coughs> so life encourages variety by reshuffling the vast amount of information that's present in DNA and then inheriting that variation into subsequent generations. So this is actually what we would say is the origin of biological creativity. So selection then of random DNA changes
does occur in other organisms besides bacteria, as exemplified by the Salvador Lori experiment. Random changes in DNA occur in all organisms. As we sit here, we are copying our DNA. Some of the time, errors are made. Mutations do occur. Some of those mutations, some of those errors, will be made in gametes. Besides that, there's, as I pointed out, other variation that's occurring during gamete formation. So these simple base pair changes, when an A now is transferred to be a G or a C to an A or so on, do these random point mutations in DNA sequence provide sufficient variation to explain all of this diversity that we see around us over time? Well, let's look at this example. A very large number of combinations can result from a relatively low or small number of variables. Shuffling two 52-card decks, for example, will produce 4 by 10 to the 24 of 52-card combinations. Or that's 4 with 24 zeros after it. Our genes are like two decks, each with 24,587 cards or so. Shuffle that deck. That's kind of a crude analogy, but it means to suggest that there is a lot of variation in the information sets that comprise the hereditary material of a human, or for that matter, any other living organism. Now, check this out. Besides simple base pair changes, which can result in an amino acid substitution, and therefore a change in an enzyme that may result in a difference in floral color, or skin color, or any other trait like this, besides these simple point mutations, what other genetic changes do we realize that can result in variations that would allow for the generation of a whole new species? Well, actually, there are a lot of them. Inter intra-chromosomal variations. Whole sets or whole segments of chromosomes can be deleted. Segments can be inserted. Duplications can occur. Whole gene duplications, whole chromosomal arm duplications, chromosomal set duplications, and so on. And in genomic sequences, we can also have insertions, deletions, and duplications. So the origins of the biological variation that we see around us are deep and plentiful. Remember, I drew out my diagram on this piece of paper one morning over coffee to uh, illustrate some of the different types of variation which can occur. And I really need to get this drawn up into a better graphic. Uh, but it's meaning to depict single base pair changes at the uh, top left of this diagram. And underneath that, genetic insertions, DNA deletions, translocations, exon shuffling, promoter shuffling, gene duplication, and whole genome duplications, which can give rise to many of the different types of variations that we see present in the diversity of life that surrounds us. So how are these types of variations propagated throughout a population? Why would any given genetic variation be propagated? Why would a darker color flower uh, eventually take over? Why would any gene be selected for? Let me give you this example. Have you ever seen flocks of blackbirds? You know, they land, they peck for seeds, and sometimes some species will post sentinels. Just in case there's a predator that wanders in, they will signal the flock, which will all of a sudden fly out uh, to safety. Well. If these are observed carefully, you can notice that in some species of these uh, types of birds, we can see ones that will peck and look for a predator, peck and look, and if a predator comes, 
it will alarm the rest of the flock and they will fly to safety. However, there are ones which will peck and not look. They will peck and not look, relying on the others to sound the alarm if there's danger present. Well, with this phenomenon, those birds have better nutrition and are better fit for long journeys. Their immune systems are stronger against diseases and their offspring have higher survival rates. Yes, their offspring have higher survival rates because of this fitness. So the gene which is influencing, or sets of genes, which is influencing the behavior to peck and not look is eventually selected for by fitness. Soon, many more cheater birds result in the population. Eventually, there are more cheater birds than those which would sound the alarm. Until, of course, the predator again takes advantage. Realize the analogy of this situation. Um, it's not just present in birds. Okay, so what did Darwin say about variation in the population and its selection and the origin of new species? Really, we can summarize this in terms of six talking points. First of all, we can recognize that variation exists in natural populations. I think we all agree after uh, the examples that we've gone over so far. Two, many more offspring are born each season than can possibly survive to maturity. Three, as a result, there is a competition that is set up, a struggle for existence that becomes a filter for genetic survival. Not individual survival, genetic survival. Four, the characteristics that are beneficial for that struggle in terms of making new offspring and passing those traits on will tend to become more common in the population, like my cheater bird example, changing overall the characteristics of that species over time. Five, successful reproduction is the only thing that matters. Individual success does not matter. Uh, it won't matter how strong of an individual you are or what characteristics you have, which may be beneficial to you overall. If those characteristics are not transmitted on to the next generation, they're lost out of the population. So over time, given a steady input of new variation into a population, these processes can lead to the emergence of a new species. I need to elaborate on that last fact. How do we actually derive a new species through this process? But first of all, what is natural selection? I find that this is one of, um, one of a large looming set of misconceptions about evolution generally. What is the filter? that we call natural selection. A lot of people misunderstand the term survival of the fittest, as if you individually can survive as the fittest. That's not what we're talking about. Natural selection itself is the filter through which the variation passes. If the Spanish flu were to take over this room, half of you are gone and it has nothing to do with how fit you are right now, but that you have the susceptibility to that virus already now, and there's nothing you can do about that. That variation exists in this room. So it's the filter that we put on it. It's the pressure, the selection pressure, in that case of the Spanish flu. But look out at nature. We can actually uh, categorize maybe these selection pressures into uh, predation selection, physiological selection, or sexual selection, or combinations of these, certainly. So in predation selection, you can think of camouflage, mimicry, speed to get away from your predator, behaviors or habits, defenses, whether those are physical or chemical. And you can think of all kinds of different organisms which exploit predation, selection, and one of these types of characteristics. 
If you look like a leaf, for example, and you're a moth or a butterfly, you may av might avoid predation by an owl. If you can outrun your predator, you might survive to have offspring. But you can't will yourself into this. Physiological selection. I mentioned already the fitness of food gathering, as exemplified by the cheater bird. Physiological efficiency. Disease resistance, like the Spanish flu. But certainly, you can see this in plants, animals, fungi. Disease resistance. Those that are resistant to a disease or a plague will live long enough to have offspring. Protection from injury, biochemical versatility. We see this all over the place in plants. Sexual selection, what is that all about? Attractiveness to a potential mate. We see this exemplified all over the plant and animal kingdom. Fertility of gametes, and ultimately, differential reproductive success. So I should point out that those are pretty much the classic categories of natural selection. But we have to think about it, too, in terms of organismal functioning. An organ may function better. Think about it. A heart, a brain, that could provide selective advantage to an individual, which could then increase in a population. This must also occur at the cellular level. Certain cell types may be selected for based on the pressure or selection that they're under. And this must occur right down to the molecular level. If you have two genes, one of which is providing an enzyme that's functioning, and the other one subject to random mutation, if it functions less, so what? We still have a functional enzyme. If you have a mutation which improves that function, this one might outcompete its, uh, its duplicate for substrate, eventually taking over the function within a single cell. So I would argue that molecular selection within a cell occurs according to the same selective pressures as does a population of organisms. And then you can see how this would go from the molecule to the tissue to the individual to the population to eventually result in large-scale changes. Predation selection, physiological selection. You can see some examples here, such as uh, what this example shows in the evolution of the antifreeze glycoprotein in fish. Some fish adapt by evolving antifreeze proteins. And this statement alone can cause misconceptions. It's not that the individual adapts. It's not that the fish wakes up one morning and thinks, I'm freezing. I need a mechanism. No, there's already variation in the population. And it's the freezing water that selects for that type of variation. Sexual selection. How does that occur? Why? Are some mates more attractive than others? Uh, this topic has been well studied. The peacock feathers are an obvious example and has been iconic in many of these studies. But you can think about these types of traits in many different animals. The bright colors of a pheasant, the big antlers of an elk, or a lion's mane. You see, in these examples, survival of an individual doesn't matter if you don't reproduce. That means attract a mate and breed. So what's a lion's mane for? Uh, that's a bit of a teleological question in, unto itself, but uh, it has attracted the attention of other biologists in the past. So it turns out that there is information that indicates that the lion's mane is involved in sexual selection uh, and mating behaviors in lions. That the lion's mane, even though it's long and presumably hot in a savanna environment, you would think would be a reproductive load 
on uh, the male lion and eventually be selected against. In fact, it's favored. That's why lions have long manes. It turns out that in this paper we see a correlation between a larger, darker mane with good nutrition, good health, and in fact higher testosterone levels. So it, in, while it imposes a cost on the individual who has it, it attracts selective pressure in the positive. Almost as if the female lion would respond, if he can deal with that mane, he must be fit. Well, that in itself is a little anthropomorphic, but in a sense, uh, that is how sexual selection operates. And we see this across many different species that influences morphologies and behaviors right down to the songs of songbirds in the spring. And it acts on both males and females in all kinds of animals as well as in plants. Oh, she's beautiful, he thinks. Or she thinks, hmm, strong legs, shiny coat, good teeth. So, uh, maybe uh, that's what love is all about. But one thing that we do notice in these types of studies is that variety is more than the spice of life. So where do new species come from? First of all, we have to recognize that species come and go. The species that are here today are not the species that were here years ago. And that new species uh, have occurred. So there is a continuation between extinction and speciation. People often ask, oh, this theory of evolution, is evolution still happening today? Or did it just happen many years ago and is now fixed in this population? Well, first of all, we have to recognize that over 95%, probably more than that, of the species that have ever existed on this planet are now extinct. There are many species that are alive today that did not exist many years ago. Look at, for example, uh, outside here there were once mastodons. Where did they go? Saber-toothed tigers. And years and years ago, dinosaurs before them. And before them, many other different varieties of arthropods and plants. The conclusion is that new species must arrive from existing ones. So if that's a given, how do new species happen? In Darwin's travels, presumably he was the first, if maybe one of the first, but certainly recognized as one of the first to draw a phylogenetic tree. And this is an illustration from Darwin's notebook depicting how species arise like branches from a tree. Some of them become dead end and become extinct. Other branches give rise to further other branches. So speciation is where one branch diverges from a pre-existing branch. How does that work? What divides one increasingly diverse species into two? And what maintains that separation after it has occurred? Well, basically, there are two classic views on this, but certainly you can come up with more in, in, in these days. But let me give you at least the two classic views about how new species are formed. One is called allopatric speciation and the other sympatric speciation. In allopatric speciation, we have a geographic isolation of a species. A new species is formed largely because of geographic isolation. I'll give you an example in a minute. Sympatric speciation 
occurs from ecological isolation. But in both of these cases, what you end up with is a genetic isolation from its progenitor. On the left, we have a diagram of allopatric speciation, uh, depicted in uh, this kind of white rodent of some sort. <coughs> so over time, uh, as shown in part B here, we have geographic isolation depicted by uh, this river, where on one side of the river, we start to get gen genetic divergence, and eventually reproductive isolation results in two populations depicted here by color, uh, which eventually over time cannot reproduce uh, to make fertile offspring. In the case of sympatric variation, we don't have a physical geographic isolation, but rather an ecological uh, isolation, again, which causes genetic divergence. In the case of ecological divergence here, or ecological isolation, depicted here we have a forest ecology versus a grassland ecology, where these two different species diverge uh, based on, it might be nutrition, it might be predation, but these two different environments cause selective pressures, which cause these two populations to eventually diverge to a point where they accumulate mutations in those populations which don't allow any further interbreeding. So the crucial difference between these two modes of speciation then is the nature of that original isolation, but the result ultimately is two separate populations which have accumulated sufficient variation which will now allow further reproductive inheritance. In other words, two species. Isolation, divergence, and reproductive isolation. Does this happen today, Dr. Kausch? Well, yeah. Here's an example of allopatric speciation uh, that is by geographic isolation uh, that was documented in squirrel habitat that was interrupted by the Grand Canyon. The result, two distinct species of ground squirrels on the different uh, canyon rims, depicted in these photographs by uh, their morphological differences, but in fact uh, these are um, geographically as well as genetically isolated. Another example, which is more recent, came about uh, with the uh, ring species uh, that have developed in salamanders whose habitat surrounds the San Joaquin Valley in California, where interbreeding was possible along most of the habitat, but at the extremes of the ring, shown in this diagram, the salamanders are distinct species. So uh, what actually caused this geographic isolation, in this case, it happened to have been a highway, which prevented the salamanders from traversing the highway, and eventually they diverge into uh, these different species as diagrammed uh, on the left in this map. We have the Monterey-type salamander in this green zone shown here, and the yellow branched, yellow blotched uh, salamander shown in the yellow here as different species which are geographically isolated by a traversing highway. Obviously, then, this is fairly recent. An example of ecological isolation, that is sympatric isolation, is shown in this example of the divergence of the apple maggot fly. This was published in the journal Nature in October year 2000 showing that the original food source was the hawthorn tree. Uh, the European apple was introduced about 100 years ago, resulting in a new distinct species that feeds and breeds then only on European apples. So this is how speciation may occur uh, in, in progress. Um, this example is the soapberry bug uh, of southeast U.S., and this, the disruptive selection based on host plant fruits resulting in 
new species being developed. So a lot is made about new species development, and it has been since the 1800s in the fascination with fossils, uh, about the connection between fossils showing that there were species that existed here at one time that are no longer here. Uh, whether this is ancient forms of birds, fish, mammals, dinosaurs, etc. So in this quote, we have, so many intermediate forms have been discovered between fish and amphibians, between amphibians and reptiles, between an reptiles and mammals, and along the primate lines of descent, that it is often difficult to identify categorically where the transition occurs from one to another particular species. I uh, quote this from the National Academy of Sciences in 2001 in an essay about evolution and creationism because it's often depicted that one of the problems with the uh, fossil record are gaps which are uh, present owing to um, really the ability to collect fossils. I mean, think about uh, how rare a fossil must be that would represent any individual species, let alone our ability to find that. Uh, as it occurs over time. But I think as this quote depicts, over time as geologists and biologists and fossil hunters have combed uh, different environments that foster fossil formation in general, these gaps themselves have largely filled in. Um, so what is made a lot to do about gaps in the fossil record have really been closed in the last 50 years or so, <coughs> and the collection of these fossils has greatly expanded, such that really so many of these intermediate forms, so-called, are present, that now it is difficult to discern speciation as it occurs directly from one organism into another. And this tells us a lot about the evolution process itself. In other words, a new species does not appear often like this, but rather gradually with the intermixing and variation of genetic forms that are present in its day as one population emerges into another. Think back about the cheater bird. The cheater bird did not all of a sudden exist. Rather, it formed, propagated its genetics, and eventually it took over that population. So does the fossil record have the intermediate forms to support common ancestry? Uh, this is often a criticism that people uh, levy when questioning evolution itself and its uh, ability to eventually make new species uh, through this, this, this method. And one of the famous examples that's brought up is that uh, the origin of whales and porpoises, etc., if these are indeed originating from land mammals, uh, what happened to the legs? Where are the intermediates uh, that would show a reduction of legs as land mammals with hair eventually became aquatic and uh, readapted to uh, a marine environment? And I think this idea came about uh, during um, the 1800s when there was a paucity of uh, fossils that represented these intermediates. And critics of evolution would say, oh yeah, right, right. So whales are derived from land mammals. So uh, what happened to their limbs? Well, actually, the missing intermediates um, were hypothesized, as shown uh, in this uh, picture to the left, and these types of fossils now um, have been excavated. There's an excellent example of one of these, for uh, instance, at the Peabody Museum uh, just down the road from here at Yale. Uh, you can walk in and, and see uh, this intermediate skeleton. And in fact, all of these intermediates uh, now have been located to fill in the missing gaps in this 
phylogenetic tree that are the intermediates. In fact, there's so many of them that it leaves little to the imagination how these limbs eventually were selected against because um, fins would be selected for the way the cheater bird uh, traits were selected for in that example. If you had fins, you could outswim a predator or you could collect more food. Uh, you could migrate to uh, more favorable reproductive habitats and bear more young. Uh, so legs in a marine environment became a detriment, not an advantage, reproductively. So whale origins became now a poster child for this type of macroevolution because there are so many different intermediates that uh, these gaps now are really not much of a question. So this is where the cheater bird becomes exemplary in how a genetic trait, in that case a behavior, can become propagated to a population and eventually um, manifest itself on a larger scale. So that these small changes, they might be uh, small traits, can eventually add up to big changes if they're applied under selection but also whether they're applied where these two populations diverge either allopatrically or sympatrically to diverge two separate populations that result in eventually new species. Is this clear? Even small changes then tend to survive and multiply within a genome uh, along the lines of success that I depicted earlier. From molecules in a cell, to cell type, to organs and tissues and individuals and populations. However, this doesn't exclude the possibility that big changes can also happen. Stephen Jay Gould from Harvard was famous for depicting what he called punctuated equilibrium that one large change could manifest such an advantage as to cause speciation to happen rather rapidly. And this has occurred in a number of instances that can be depicted in geologic history. Maize may be an example of this, but punctuated equilibrium. Such mutations may occur, for example, in transcription factors. Master switch genes that regulate the expression of many other genes may be responsible for such punctuated equilibrium and rapid speciation or changes that occur uh, in the geologic record. It's tempting when you look at diagrams like this dinosaur becoming a bird or a primate walking to become a human that this happens very rapidly um, or that it could happen willfully. Let's face it, the dinosaur did not will itself into having feathers, any more than I could, any more than a chimpanzee could will itself to become a human. This is just simply not the way it happens. We're tempted into thinking this by the way we think about purpose itself. I can, as an individual, have purpose. If I say, I am going to pick up my coffee cup. So my thought process is directed towards picking up that coffee cup and my action of completing that convinces me of that purpose. But it's teleological to impart that onto the formation of feathers in the evolution of birds. Birds did not evolve feathers in order to fly. This is also further exemplified in the coming of corn, which happened rapidly roughly about nine to 10,000 years ago in Oaxaca, Mexico. It happened so suddenly as to stimulate myths and stories, such as the story of the coming of corn depicted by David Bouchak's book uh, in the story from the Cherokee. Uh, but we also know from work on genetics of mutations which contributed to the actual origins of corn. And I use that example because we will bring this up when we talk about agriculture and the origin of domesticated plants. 
Where did the plants we eat come from? None of them exist in the wild. Many of them are new species. Okay, so that concludes my section on how evolution happens.